I'm Jeroen van Mij, and welcome to my lecture series on computer and network security. In this fifth and last video on authentication and access control, I will talk about the IP security or IPsec protocol and how it can be used to create virtual private networks or VPNs. IP layer security or IPsec is an ITF standard which was already standardized in 1995 and it provides end-to-end -end authentication of both users and messages, confidentiality to avoid eavesdropping and key management to share private keys between both, both hosts and entire networks on top of the IP protocols, either IP version 4 or 6. It's widely used to uh, provide VPN or virtual private network based security and tunneling. And there are several useful scenarios where IPsec can be used. For example, imagine a company with two remote sites that are connected over the public internet. But uh, the um, <clears throat> employees of the company want to securely communicate between sites as if they were part of the same local area network. For this, IPsec can be used. Also, to securely connect over a public unencrypted Wi-Fi hotspot, an IPsec tunnel can be set up. Or to safely connect from home to a school or company network. And to enable these different usage scenarios, IPsec has two modes of operation. The first one is called transport mode. Transport mode is most suitable for protecting upper layer traffic between two end hosts that are directly communicating with one another. It only encrypts the payload of the IP packets and not the header. The second mode of operation is tunnel mode. In this mode, the entire IP packet is encrypted and or authenticated. This includes the header. It is then encapsulated into an IP and to a new IP packet. IPsec in this case is implemented at the edges of the local network, for example at the edge between a corporate network and the public internet. This also means that the end hosts do not need to support IPsec. Also the routers along the path cannot read the original IP header, so they don't know who is the original sender and receiver. They only know the corporate network from which the packet originates originates or to which it is destined. And I have a straightforward question related to this. Which of the two IPsec modes is more vulnerable to traffic analysis attacks? Recall that this is a type of passive attack where an attacker tries to derive information about the traffic that's being transmitted. Is it transport mode, tunnel mode, or both are equally vulnerable? Feel free to pause the video if you want to think about your answer. And let's take a look at the correct answer. The correct answer is transport mode is more vulnerable. Why is that? Well, because in transport mode, the original source and destination IP address are not encrypted, so they are readable to anyone that intercepts the traffic. In tunnel mode, the original source and destination IP are encrypted and therefore cannot be read, but cannot be read by someone, a malicious user that intercepts the traffic. And fundamental in the IPsec architecture is a concept of a security policy applied to each IP packet that transits from the source to a destination. The IPsec policy is determined by the interaction between two databases, the Security Association Database, or SAD, and the Security Policy Database, or SPD. And a Security Association is a one-way logical connection that provides security services from sender to receiver. As such, the security association will determine what kind of security protections in terms of confidentiality and authentication need to be provided to packets. Each security association is uniquely identified based on the destination IP address combined with a security parameter index or SPI. This is a unique 32-bit identifier of that security association. The Security Association Database, or SAD, 
provide, keeps track of all the security associations in the network. On the other hand, the SPD maps IP packets that are either transmitted or received onto security associations based on the IP header fields. The IKE or Internet Key Exchange is responsible for managing and exchanging security keys that are used in the authentication and confidentiality or encryption processes. And this figure shows how outgoing packets, outbound packets, are processed by IPsec. As I mentioned, packets are processed one by one. When a new packet <clears throat> is received from the upper layers, the security policy database is searched for a matching policy for this type of packet based on the header fields, such as the IP source and destination address in the packet. If no match is found, the packet is discarded and therefore not transmitted. If a match is found, the policy is determined. There are three types of policies that can be applied to a packet. It can be discarded, it can bypass IPsec, or it can be protected. If it is discarded, it's obviously not transmitted. If, it, uh, if the policy is to bypass IPsec, the packet is forwarded as a regular IP packet without any additional security. If the decision is to protect the packet, the Security Association Database, or SAD, is searched for an existing security association that matches this packet. If it is not found, then the Internet Key Exchange, or IKE, is used to create a security association, negotiate all the necessary uh, private and public keys, and so on. After this negotiation is done, the security association database is queried again, and now a match should be found. The packet is then processed by adding a new additional uh, header, an IPsec header, which can be based on two approaches, ESP or AH, and then the packet is forwarded over the network. In this figure, you can see how incoming packets are processed by IPsec. So an inbound packet is received. The, um, the receiving host will then determine whether it's a regular IP packet or an IPsec packet. If it's a regular IP packet, um, it is uh, transferred to the security policy database and it will check whether this type of packet can bypass IPsec or not. If it can bypass IPsec, the packet is delivered as is to the higher layers of the network, such as TCP or UDP. However, if for this type of packet, IP security cannot be bypassed, the packet is discarded as the proper security measures were not used. If it is an IPsec packet, the security association database is searched. If no match is found, it means that the sending host never negotiated a security association, so no keys have been exchanged and so on. This means the packet cannot be decrypted or authorized or authenticated, so the packet is discarded. If a match is found, the packet can be decrypted and authenticated using either AH or ESP, and then the payload can, after decryption, be delivered to the higher network layers. As I mentioned, IPsec provides two alternative methods to enable security. The first one is ESP, which stands for Encapsulating Security Payload. The other one is AH, which stands for Authentication Header. In this video, I will talk in more details about ESP as it is more flexible, since ESP can provide both confidentiality through encryption and authentication. The Authentication Header can only provide authentication, as the name already implies. The good thing about ESP is that it can be used in combination with a, a wide range of an existing encryption and authentication algorithms, so it does not say or state which specific algorithm has to be used for encryption mm -hmm. or authentication. And on top of authentication and confidentiality, it provides a variety of other services, services like origin authentication, integrity of the packet, an anti-replay service, and traffic flow confidentiality. To avoid traffic analysis. And here you can see the packet format used by ESP. 
As you can see, ESP adds some additional header fields to the existing IP packet. First is the security parameter index or SPI. As I mentioned before, together with the destination IP address, this SPI uniquely identifies the security association. Second is the sequence number. The sequence number is used for anti-replay functionality. The initialization value or IV is optional and is used by some security algorithms like encryption algorithms to initialize certain values. Then the remainder of the payload is added, which includes the IP header and the actual data payload. Subsequently, some padding is included. There is on one hand the traffic flow confidentiality or TFC padding, and on the other hand, regular padding so that the payload becomes a multiple of 32 bits. The TFC padding is used to conceal the actual length of the payload and the regular padding to provide some flow confidentiality. Finally, the integrity is, uh, an integrity check value is included to check the integrity of the ESP packet and avoid uh, attackers from changing anything in the uh, ESP uh, header fields. And as I said, each packet includes a sequence number to avoid replay attacks. The sequence number is used to detect if a packet is mm -hmm. transmitted multiple times. For example, an attacker could intercept a packet and retransmit it later. By keeping track of the sequence numbers of received packets, this can be avoided. However, it's not as trivial as just keeping track of the last sequence number that has been received because IP packets can arrive out of order. As such, a window is used, and this window has a fixed size W. All sequence numbers of received packets within this window are stored at the destination. So they are marked if whenever a valid packet is received. An unmarked cell means that the packet with that sequence number has not been received yet. If a packet within this window is received that has already been marked, the packet is dropped. If a packet is received with a sequence number lower than the uh, first packet in the window, so n minus w, where n is the highest sequence number received to date, then the packet is also dropped and is considered a replay. On the other hand, if a packet is received with a sequence number higher than n, then the window moves up to include this new packet that has been received. To make sure everyone understands how the replay window works, I have a question for you. So given a replay window over the interval packet ID 120 to 183, what will be the replay window after receiving the packets with the sequence number 190, 180, and 125 in that order. Feel free to think about it and pause the video. And let's take a look at what the correct answer is. The correct answer is 127 to 190. As the um, when packet with sequence number 190 is received, the window will move seven positions as this packet falls in front of the current replay window. And let's take a look at what happens exactly as these three packets are received for this example. So when the um, first packet with sequence number 190 arrives, the current replay window starts at packet 120 and ends at packet 183, both inclusive. Packet 190 falls in front of this current replay window, and as I mentioned, the window will move up seven packets. So now packet 190 will be successfully received because it hadn't been received before, and the replay window will um, go from packet 127 to 190. Then the packet 180 arrives. The packet with sequence number 180 falls within the bounds of the current replay window. That means if packet with 
um, sequence number 180 had not been received yet, the um, ID of that packet will be marked in the replay window buffer and the packet will be successfully received. It, if it had already been received, it will just be dropped. Finally, the packet with sequence number 125 arrives. This sequence number falls outside of the replay window and actually before the first packet in the replay window, which is, which is uh, the one with sequence number 127. So this packet is automatically dropped without checking if it had actually been received before or not. And let's take a closer look at how packet encapsulation works for ESP mode in both transport and tunnel mode. Recall that in transport no mode, only the um, IP layer payload is actually encrypted and authenticated. That means that the TCP header, if TCP is used, but it could also be UDP, and the application layer data payload are encrypted. The ESP header is inserted behind the original IP header, as well as the ESP trailer and authentication. In tunnel mode, on the other hand, the original IP header is also encrypted and authenticated. That means that the ESP header is added in front of it and a new IP header is included. So that means that the original IP header is part of the encrypted and authenticated payload. And the last piece of the puzzle is the internet key exchange, which is used by IPsec to determine and distribute the secret keys that are used for encryption, or in other words, confidentiality, and authentication of messages or integrity. In practice, up to four keys are often used, as a security association is for a one-way connection there are two security associations in a two-way communication, and each of these will have a key for confidentiality and optionally integrity for a total of four keys. There are two main key exchange methods. The first one is manual key exchange, where the system administrator will manually configure the keys on each of the hosts that are communicating over IPsec. This can be used if only a small number of hosts need to communicate. For example, let's say two um, company locations need to transmit securely transmit data over the internet with each other. Then the two endpoints uh, in those uh, the entry points in those two locations can be configured manually with IPsec with manual keys. There's also an automated method for on-demand creation of keys for security associations. This automated method was called ISAKMP slash Oakley in IP, IP, uh, Internet Key Exchange version 1. In uh, Internet Key Exchange version 2, and that name is not used anymore, but the method is very similar. And this method consists of two components. The first one is the Oakley Key Determination Protocol. This is basically an extension of the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange algorithm that I explained in a previous video. The second part is the ISAKMP, which stands for Internet Security Association and Key Management Protocol. This is a communication protocol that is used to negotiate um, security attributes and to exchange keys. So basically, this is the protocol used to exchange the information needed for um, the Diffie-Hellman algorithm to generate the keys. As I already mentioned, IPsec can be used with a wide variety of cryptographic algorithms. It does not mandate or dictate the use of a specific one. However, to facilitate interoperability between different implementations, some combinations of algorithms referred to as suites have been standardized. First of all, RFC 4308 of the IETF specifies that each IPsec implementation should support two specific configurations. The first one is VPN A and the second one VPN B. VPN A mainly relies on triple DES and HMAC to provide encryption and integrity, while VPN B uses AES for both encryption and integrity. On top of that, the ITF RFC 6379 
uh, proposes some other optional um, cryptographic suites, mostly relying on AES and HMAC as well. This ends the last video on authentication and access control. I thank you very much for watching.